Titles. Everything good there? Yep. Uh, good morning, I'm Steve Keeler, one of uh, One Million Cups organizers. As many of you know, One Million Cups um, is an organization for the betterment of entrepreneurs across the United States. Uh, 190 cities, I believe, of most recent. All meeting at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning in the various time zones. You happen to be attending the best chapter of all 190. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure this morning to introduce a fellow that I met recently. Uh, he's a former U.S. Marine. Thank you for your service. A former law enforcement. A former law enforcement agent, a forensic expert, and a newly evolving entrepreneur. <laughs> so let me introduce Bill Powell and his sidekick, Gemini. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm, I'm Bill, and I'm especially thankful for this microphone, as you can here I woke up, of course, on the day of the presentation, losing my voice. Uh, it's pretty rare that I get to use a microphone when I present. Uh, thankfully, I, I have one today. So, so yeah, I'm here to talk for a few minutes about Airtree Solutions. It's a digital forensics expert business firm uh, that I've started. Uh, you might be wondering, what the heck is that? What is digital forensics? How is this guy even an expert in the field? So I think we can talk a little bit about my background and what brought me here today, what got me into uh, the, the practice of digital forensics. So as Keeler mentioned, I am a United States Marine. Uh, as, as you know, some of you may know, I know we have a couple of soldiers here in the audience. Uh, once a Marine, always a Marine. So I identify myself as a Marine. Uh, I serve mostly uh, on the East Coast of Florida to the basic in Paris Island. Um, thankfully, I did not want a full metal jacket before I shipped out. Uh, I probably would not have signed up I went to that first. Um, but it was great. And it really laid the foundation of what we'll see here in a few slides of the, the key tenets that drive, drive me personally and professionally. I am a former law enforcement officer and task force agent. This is really where I got into the, the practice of digital forensics. Um, I joined. Gemini's making switch hands here. I joined law enforcement because after the Marine Corps, I had a career in IT, and I know we have some fellow IT nerds here in the audience as well. Um, and I figured there's probably not a lot of IT expertise in law enforcement. Now I can say that I'm a former cop. Um, I would not advise you to say that. Stop, uh, traffic stop. But I figured maybe I can help out uh, because a lot of things are happening now involving technology, computers, cell phones, etc. So pretty quickly I became a detective and I started working in applying my knowledge and got some training in computer forensics and I started working from there, testifying, uh, getting sworn testimony in the area of digital forensics. Now, different things drive different people. Some people are motivated to become very good at their craft because they want to make money, right? You start a business to you want to make some money. Something very, I believe, very unique drove me to really dive in uh, and become the best I possibly could be in the area of digital forensics. You see, you understand, of course, in law enforcement, people's freedom is at stake, right? And you expect us to do a good job do a very thorough and competent job uh, in what we do. The stakes were a little bit higher for me in my work in law enforcement, especially uh, on the task force. I was assigned as a task force agent to a statewide cyber and high tech crime task force here in Florida. Under that uh, banner, I had statewide jurisdiction, so I was not limited to my municipality or my home agency. So the stakes were exceptionally high for me. And when I say lives were depending on the work that I did in computer forensics, um, that is not hyperbole. You see, 
very small, very young lives, depending on what I did. Most of what I did on that task force involved the hunting of people who were seeking to victimize children. And I guess that gives you some insight to why I have my little friend here today, Gemini. So I had to become very, very good at digital forensics because I had to be able to stand up in trial. I had to be able to withstand uh, the defense counsel. And should they hire an expert, my work had to be able to withstand scrutiny so that these old children uh, would be safe and would be in harm's way. So as a result of that, I testified in numerous cases, um, both in trial, Positions, giving sworn testimony in the area of digital forensics, even for cases that I had nothing to do with uh, as an investigator, but I analyzed the evidence um, and provided expert testimony. Everything ranging from uh, homicide and so forth into the subject matter I just spoke about. I went on to get a Master of Science degree in digital forensics. Um, from the University of Central Florida. I collected, I couldn't even count how many technical certifications, uh, forensic certifications in the field, but I currently work as a uh, digital forensics investigator, a digital forensics analyst. Through the work that I've done in law enforcement and after law enforcement as a civilian, I've been able to provide assistance to the Secret Service, the NCA, everyone always asks me, Who's the NCA? I'm not sure if we have anyone from the UK here. That's the National Crime Agency in the UK. That's essentially, you can think of it as their FBI, uh, and as well as Interpol. So again, uh, I find myself having to rise to a very high standard to be able to feed some of these federal agencies uh, and Interpol uh, with the evidence and the analysis they need take action and, and complete their mission. And that's Jeffrey Beach. So I talked a little bit about my background that involves some of the training. Um, I'm a certified forensic computer expert um, and, and examiner. Part of that means that I also give back by mentoring or teaching others that are looking to get into the field, or maybe they've been in the field but they don't have the certification, they don't have anything behind their name to show that they have been properly trained, they have been properly vetted in this field. So I mentored those candidates through a very lengthy process, um, through the same certification that I have. Um, again, expert testimony uh, in cases ranging from homicide to crimes against children, as well as civil cases. So once I left law enforcement, um, I started making friends with civil attorneys and have been retained by them to assist in some of their civil cases. Kind of a breath of fresh air, um, but it kind of shows the versatility. Um, the expert analysis with Secret Service, NCA, and Interpol again. Um, most notably with the Secret Service, um, I'm sure you've heard of malware um, code that the bad guys put on their on your computers to get your information or take control of your computer. Well, there's often the question of, well, but what exactly does it do? So it was found on a computer, so what? What does it do with certainty? And that's where they retained me to analyze that malware and show them with certainty uh, the, the effects of this malware and the attribution back to uh, what we, who we believe are the authors of that malware. So what do I offer? I offer expert case and evidence analysis. So when the stakes are high and you've retained an attorney, whether it be criminal defense or civil matters, and there's electronic evidence, a computer, a cell phone, the question of was an email sent, when was it sent exactly, that sort of thing. Um, I take a look at that evidence and I take a look at the case as a whole and I provide that expert feedback to the attorneys to let them know 
this is where I think you can, you can expand your case and really focus on the other side, how they handled the evidence, um, what exactly they did, is their methodology scientific, is it reproducible, and repeatable, that sort of thing. I help the attorneys separate the narrative from the noise. I don't know if you ever read some of these reports, some of them can be a couple of hundred pages. And oftentimes it's a couple of hundred pages of filler to impress you with a very large, very long, very lengthy report, very proposed report. I separate all of that garbage from them and highlight to the attorney, this is the actual narrative. This is what this person is saying once we cut the fluff out. And if this is what they're saying, and this is what they did, here's the problems they have, and here's the opportunity you have. I provide trial support. Um, for example, a civil attorney retained me to sit in on a deposition where he was deposing someone who was very technical. And the attorney, while an expert in the field of law, is not an expert in the technical area. And quite honestly, he didn't know if what he was being told was reasonable, unreasonable, fact, he didn't know. So I provided trial support for that attorney by sitting in on that deposition and letting him know, this is where you need to focus. He's gonna fall apart because he did not follow the scientific methodology in uh, computer forensics. Now the fourth one may seem like common sense, direct access to the forensic expert. And I'll speak a little bit about what that means and what happens in this field. There are other digital forensics expert witness firms out there. Um, oftentimes, those firms will assign the work to somebody, but they will provide a different person, a company representative, to the depositions, to the trial, and so forth. So the actual person who's gonna advocate for you may not be the person with the bona fides in computer forensics. They may be a company representative. So what are you actually getting? Who knows? You're getting someone who can interpret a report, but that's not what you hire. That's not what you're paying off for your case. So with me, they get direct access to me. I'm the one that shows up in court, puts my hand in the air, swears and affirms, and provides that expert testimony. I'm the one that does the, the analysis. And finally, I am the advocate for you. For the law firms that hire me, I am their advocate. I'm not there to prove the opposition's case. Um, I'm there to show them what the digital evidence shows and presents, and the story the evidence tells, which oftentimes is not the narrative that the opposing side wants to tell. So we don't twist the evidence to, to fit it into the puzzle. We see, we see it for what it is. This is what a puzzle piece looks like, nothing else. So that ties into the benefit that I provide to these attorneys. I allow them to control the narrative. I allow them to be able to confidently separate all of that noise and all of that fluff and grandstanding and focus on this is what the evidence actually says. I provide the attorney's expert testimony, expert case support in the area of digital forensics, and the unique position that I'm in, I'm coming to them as someone that has stood on the stand, not as an expert witness in other cases, but not, not just as an expert witness in other cases, but somebody who had to rise to that standard. So I didn't start a business yesterday and call myself an expert and provided one deposition. I'm coming to them as someone that has, when the stakes were at their highest, been on the stand and been under scrutiny and survived that. I help them apply digital forensics in a way that's advantageous to their client. Quite honestly, a lot of times the attorneys just simply don't know what to ask or what to look at. They're experts at the law. And like a lot of friends of mine, they use their computers to check email and type word documents. And that's okay. They don't have to be experts in this area. That's why I'm here. 
So I help them look at all of the evidence that's available and how it may be advantageous to their case. Now being as smart as you want to be doesn't serve you if you can't communicate it. One of the downfalls a lot of times, especially with us technical nerds, is that we want to show you all the technical details that went into this great piece of work we did. Appreciate the complexity of this code. Yeah, people don't care. Other nerds care, right? We will have some coffee and talk about it and appreciate it. The lay people don't care. So it serves you no benefit if you cannot communicate it in plain English accurately, but in a way that the average person can digest that and say, oh, I get it. Now I understand what's happening. And that's what I do. And that's what I had to do in my former career in law enforcement. I'm not trying to convince another forensics nerd of what happened. I'm trying to communicate to that lay jury member and have them understand. Because this evidence looks like this, it can only be this scenario that produces that. So the, the guiding principles or the guiding tenets that drive me professionally in this endeavor and in all areas is my commitment to the relationship with my clients. Um, it is not X amount of dollars for X amount of hours. Somebody's livelihood, somebody's life, somebody's freedom is at stake. And I develop that relationship with that client because it's very meaningful and impactful to them. So therefore, for me to do what I do, it's meaningful and impactful for me as well. I've already mentioned that I've had to rise to the highest standards in my field to be able to successfully do what I did, and this is no different. The stakes might be a little different, but it's really no different when we get down to it. The will to win for my clients is very strong in what I do. You come to me for assistance in the area in which I excel, so we need to we need to win. I advocate for this client. I don't simply present the evidence and walk away and cash the check and go on to the next one. That's not what this is about. Obviously, the quality of my work should be a attendance in all of our endeavors. I'm personally accountable. Um, again, going back to my last reference, where when you hire an expert in some firms, you get somebody from the company who shows up to testify on your behalf and on behalf of the evidence. I made it very personal. It's Bill Powell that shows up. It's Bill Powell that answers the phone when you call me and you have a question or you have a concern. In this field, technology is forever changing. Our techniques, our methodologies, our tools are constantly changing. And with that, I have to have that drive to constantly stay on top of what's happening in this field. And finally, going back to what a veterinary sergeant told me when I was a young PFC, I guess I was, when he told me from the Marine Corps, it's about doing the right thing the first time, every time. And that's what I carry into my personal life and into my business as well. You don't get shortcuts. You don't get rounding the corners and kind of sidestepping certain things. What you get from me as the expert witness is someone who does the right thing for you and your client every time, regardless of how that looks. So why am I here? And what do I hope to, to get? What kind of assistance do I believe can be offered here? First and foremost, I want your candid feedback. And if that feedback is, I have no idea what you're talking about, though. I have no idea what an expert witness. I didn't know they existed. That's great. Let's talk about that. Because a lot of people don't. Until you need And then it's a little bit later. So I want your candid feedback. I do need help developing brand awareness. So when I was in law enforcement, in the criminal justice system, I was known a brand, if you will. So they knew when they saw a report, 
in the signature on the bottom that said Tesco State and Powell, they knew what they're getting. And some defense attorneys knew what they were getting as well, what they saw. Now the civilian, and there's attorneys out there that quite simply don't know who I am. How am I an expert? How am I qualified to help them and their clients? So I do need help with developing brand awareness and developing strategic and targeted marketing. Um, this is obviously not a service for the masses, if you will. Um, this is not something your average consumer goes to a website and buys because it's fun, interesting, and exciting. This is something that primarily attorneys are interested in. People may need to be aware as well. If you own a business and you have employees and you're concerned about anything that may happen digitally, theft of intellectual property, theft of credit card numbers, any of that sort of thing. So targeting a very strategic market, a very strategic client um, is what I need help with. And finally, simply continuing the conversation. Now, I did not put case studies in here because this is not appropriate for this audience, right? I'm not trying to get you to sign a, a, a contract with me. But part of that developing the conversation is, let's have that frank discussion. Let me tell you about a case. And let me tell you about how the opposing counsel asked zero questions. And was that a proper service for their client? What if you were that client who was depending on the analysis and the expert opinion of this digital evidence and you realize your attorney asked no questions about it, you never hired an expert, what could that have meant to your case? That's, that's all I have for you this morning. Thank you. Uh, before we get into our question and answer session, let me let me bridge a gap that perhaps I should have uh, addressed right up front. Uh, Bill came to SCORE, which is right down the street, an affiliated organization that helps entrepreneurs. And uh, he works, currently works for and worked for a corporation and was an employee that did this for a living. And he came to John Anderson, many of you know John, and myself were assigned his account. And he wanted to get into business for himself. Attorneys are his clients. And the first thing that we all mutually decided on was we need to put everything down in a format, uh, in presentation form that you can use to stand up in front of an attorney or a group of attorneys and make them your clients. Well, what are your fees, Bill? Uh, depends on the job. Depends on what you guys do. How much an hour? Uh, roughly, you can say two fifty to three hundred an hour. It's good wages. Um, and so, Million Cups became a, a terrific bridge for him to move away from a corporation into his own business. A week after, um, a week after we first met. Bill sent an email to John and myself and said, I just, I think I'm in business. I got my first client. Uh, he paid me $3,000. And it took me an hour to uh, help him with my services. And so Bill is now an entrepreneur. He's now in business. His, uh, his clients are attorneys. And I filled that gap to bridge into the question and answer session. So let's let's start with Paul. Alex. Alex and I have uh, signature real estate result. Um, a great presentation, and uh, you know, as I was listening to you and watching you, one of the things that popped up for me is you're trying to build a business. Obviously, is how do you scale this because just listening to the information, like you're like a one-man computer system, you know, it's like, um, will it be a problem if you want to expand? Because you can only have so many hours a day you can build, but uh, what if 
you need help and uh, you know who can you rely on because one of the points you had there said that a lot of companies send you somebody else right. so how do you scale okay, thank you. Thanks, um, one of the things that I do uh, I, I continue to do even after I've left law enforcement is maintain my contacts and maintain my relationships with law enforcement so there are quite a number of for digital forensics practitioners in law enforcement do similar to what I did. Uh, and they're interested in leaving law enforcement for a variety of reasons. They're looking at retirement and so on and so forth. And so that's a, that's a very deep well of talent. And uh, people who have been scrutinized and put on the stand, as I described, I have been, um, that are available to the private sector. Hey, no. uh, Tom Jordan, fascinating presentation. I love this stuff. So I've got, I got, I guess I have a comment and then a, a question. From a marketing and branding standpoint, why not Pear Tree Digital Forensics to be more specific so people know right away what you do? The other question really is that's more of a comment. How much psychology or or knowledge of human nature goes into your work in dissecting? What the digital image looks like. Yeah, so let me, let me talk about the second one, the second question uh, first. Uh, the short answer is quite a lot if you want to be effective and good at, at what you're doing. So there's, there's kind of two philosophies. One would say you can look at the digital evidence um, totally blind. Let me just look at the ones and the zeros and see what it says. I don't follow that philosophy myself. The second philosophy is, if I'm whoever, whatever the case may be, I'm the hacker, or I'm the uh, employee who went bad and is stealing intellectual property, if I'm that actor, what would I do? How would, how would I achieve it? Um, what might I do to thwart the efforts of a forensics practitioner? if that makes sense. And that tell, that lets me not only, so getting into the head of that person, not only lets me look at the evidence and see what the evidence tells me, but let me follow the footsteps that they may have walked through and I, am I seeing footprints and fingerprints that I may not have seen otherwise. So for me, the psychology and, and the study of people who do these things is very critical to what I do. Uh, the, first, the first comment you made, yeah, it, it's a point taken. Um, I think I didn't. I think I didn't say digital forensics or expert witness or something like that in the name um, because there's quite honestly more that I do beyond that, or I could be hired to do more beyond that. Um, but I provide solutions. So, for example, a company may hire me because they believe an ex-employee has gained access to their systems after they were terminated, um, and they'll. The, the basic answer is, can you tell us if it happened? And if so, when and how? Well, they may not be interested in me as an expert witness, per se, but they may be interested in me telling them, yeah, it looks like he, someone from this IP address did come in, and here's what you can do to fix it and shore up your, your environment. Um, Arthur Burns, a feed, feedback and then a quick question. If it, it seems like it's all about you. It's all about what you can do for the people and you are the company. I wouldn't even use the, the name. I would have WilliamPowell.com or something similar to that because it's about you and your uh, backing and, and such. If you're trying to create a bigger company than what uh, Alex said uh, holds true, if it's, if it's all about you, you don't have any expandability. If you're looking to build a big company, that's different than wanting to do your personal brand. But as a computer scientist, I ask you how many innocent people you've represented, represented because anybody in here that has a router with no password or is using the password one, two, three, four, five, you can have a hacker into your equipment in seconds, and they can put stuff on your device or on your network that makes you a criminal. Am I not 
mistaken? No, you're, you're correct. And your first point is well taken, and I appreciate that. Uh, your second point, there are people that I've helped who were not criminals, I guess if we can categorize them that way. Um, you know, business owners, uh, individuals, that sort of thing. And quite honestly, a lot of times they are just ignorant to effective security. And it could be your home computer and you think, who would want my stuff? Uh, it could be a business and what you're trying to focus on every day is keeping the lights on and keeping products flowing. Um, so I have, I have helped people like that as well. Uh, and, and I would say just as a, as a quick note, even the people who are suspected of having done things, um, what's critical, that there was a, a defense attorney who told me one time when I was a relatively new cop, and he said, I live in this community and I don't want them out here any more than the next person, but I want to make sure it's done right. And we're going to preserve our structure, our constitution, our laws. That way, we're not loosening things up to this guy because we think he did it, because that will be used against us one day. So that's that's what lets me even help people who've been accused of something. We're going to do it the right way. And if the evidence leads to them finding a new place to live for 20, 30 years, then so be it. Tina Carmel with Access Senior Resource and Consultant and Angel Senior with a great presentation. Um, on your name, Pear Tree Solutions, I have two questions. What made you come up with that name? Because it doesn't attach to what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if Keeler told you to ask that, because he was no, almost trying right. to ask that as no. well. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're right. It has nothing to do with what I offer or what I do. Um, the, the honest story is, I was living in Japan, I had a friend of mine from England, and he was, we were trading DVDs, and he showed me a sitcom from England uh, called I'm Alan Partridge. Uh, the new character is played by Steve Coogan. Uh, and I, I happen to like Steve Coogan, and I'm one of like seven Americans who appreciate British comedy. Uh, and uh, his last name was Partridge, and I believe he was a like, disc jockey or radio show host or whatever, and uh, his, his company was Pear Tree Productions or something like that. It was kind of my homage to British comedy. Okay, and then, because I'm thinking about branding, and then on the other hand, when it comes to your branding and people that you can reach out to, it's always good to be connected to the connected. So places like um, community-based care, who deals with a lot of children, and they also deal with attorneys, you can connect with them. You can also connect with um, the CDC, you can connect with, um, they also have um, our guardian ad litem and disability solutions. All three of those groups utilize a lot of attorneys, a lot of times for children, for um, juveniles, and so forth and so on. But that will just connect you to even more attorneys. And when those groups can say, oh, he's a great guy, it gives you kind of affirmation and confirmation that they're not going to use you. Okay. No, that's great. Thank you. Mr. Trotter. Hi, Adrian Trotter with Trotter Media. I uh, really enjoyed your presentation. I'm also a tech nerd, so I kind of understood where you're coming from. Um, I had a um, suggestion or just a comment as well. With um, you know, everyone kind of echoed it in the room, like I said the same thing about being an entrepreneur and also having your name, having your name as the, your brand. I've worked with people that that has been influential and, and pivotal because when you already have the groundwork, I saw from your presentation that you already have like your name is what you would use to sign stuff. Right. So I would say like having even that as people that you've dealt with in the past start to recognize you as you start to grow, they'll say that's the guy. And so just having even just your name as the dot com would be huge because people might be watching you now on you know million cups and then say hey let me let me search this guy they might not know pear tree but they'll know who it is so. yeah that's a great point thank you and sometimes when i'm speaking with people and i allude to some of my cases that i've been involved with without giving details and so forth um they'll they'll google and they'll read about it and then usually i'll get a text from them oh my god you're that guy yeah that's you mm -hmm. um so i you know, I certainly don't want to capitalize on 
or exploit those cases, but I, it's a very valid point uh, when they look at my body of work to be able to say, you're that guy. Yeah, yeah thank you. Is there anybody in the room that may have a suggestion as to how Bill may get in front of key attorneys or key groups of attorneys? Hi. <coughs> uh, good morning, Bill. Tyler of the Comp Networks, Inc. Um, good job uh, on the presentation. Uh, I think you did a good job telling your story. Um, in terms of how to establish yourself, I, I recognize your, your uh, adverts to declaiming yourself an expert. Uh, I get that saying, it's called the imposter syndrome. So, um, not a problem. I would recommend, there's a lot of attorneys that have podcasts and video shows, et cetera, uh, that are using the mediums to establish themselves as experts in particular fields as well as, as the, the two. So they're always looking for content, they're always looking for someone else to be on their show, especially ones that aren't attorneys, because that's you know super boring listening to two attorneys talk. But, um, you know, if you could, I would say put yourself out there. I would start researching and listening to some other podcasts that are around and, and you know, come up with a package to kind of put yourself out there. You know, here's who I am, here's what I can talk about, if I can ever be of value. Um, that would help you uh, a lot, um, you know. And then you might also consider it for yourself, you know, uh, where you do the reverse. You interview attorneys about the cases that you've worked on and how digital forensics work for them. Uh, so you don't have to do it every day. You don't have to do it every week. You know, you could do once a month. That's 12 a year. Um, you know, so uh, I would consider something like that. Uh, there's a couple people here in the room that can help you with both audio and video. So, yeah. all right. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And, and you're right. It's hard to present yourself as an expert at something. Yeah. It feels like it's ego speaking yeah. rather right. than your, your body of work. You are doing great. Yeah, and you know, the, the very first time I gave a deposition as a forensics expert, I have a state attorney next to me, the defense attorney asked me, so what qualifies you as an expert? And at that point, I didn't like defense attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I had not grown to appreciate them yeah. right at that point. And my answer to him was, I don't know, ask the guy that told you I was. Yeah. Did not earn points with the state attorney. But yeah, yeah. The, the first slide after the title was my hardest slide I put together. So thank you. My name is Digital Dan, I'm a forensics fan. What do you think I did? I'm kidding here, but I, really, I, I did have that flow to life one day. I am user certified for Delta Salt and Oxygen Forensics. What do you use? So it depends on what I'm trying to do. So as you may know, and I, the others may not, may not know, part of, part of what's critical in computer forensics is not just using a tool to do something, but being able to validate that tool that it actually does what it's supposed to do. Uh, and the results it produces are the results that really is in the evidence. And a good example of that was the Casey Anthony trial, when uh, yeah. the, they were caught with two tools looking at the same evidence producing different results, and they didn't have a good answer for, well, what is the actual evidence saying, and how did you validate the tool? So, you know, for, for a lot of the heavy lifting in disk forensics, I use x-rays. Um, depending on the other types of evidence, uh, you know, I may, I may use tools that I've developed, that I've coded, uh, that I can and do validate against no evidence. Um, Mag and IEF I use as well. Um, not, not a huge fan of their new product, but the magnet forensics I, I do use, is, uh, the IEF I, I do use. So it really depends on the task that I'm trying to achieve, and what tool have I validated to be reliable and produce uh, uh, repeatable, reliable results. Hi, Bill. Um, my first question for you is, uh, I know all your cases are different, but what, like, kind of in a nutshell, what does your typical case look like? Is it, is it mostly like computer break-ins and hacking, following digital footprints, or what, what does it look like for you? Like if I were to pitch you, so I work with a lot of attorneys, but if I were to pitch you, I would say this is a guy that can do what? So I'll avoid giving you the normal forensics answer, but it depends. Um, the, I would say the bulk of my cases involve suspected uh, hacking, or someone's at least raising the allegation that well, someone hacked into my computer. And that may be the problem, 
or that may be what they believe mitigates uh, the evidence against that. It wasn't me, the hacker broke in and did it, that sort of thing. Uh, that, that's a lot of my cases. Some of my cases have been corporations who feel an employee has done something inappropriate accessing the system after they've been terminated, um, going to inappropriate sites, uh, exposing the entity to malware, ransomware, things like that. Um, it, it, what it comes down to is there's always a, the commonality would be there's always a question or questions that can be answered by digital evidence or may be answered by digital evidence, so there may be an absence of evidence, right? And so whatever the question is, it usually comes down to, it may be, the answer may be found in the digital evidence. How do we get there, and how do we get there reliably with someone who will be able to stay up in court should it come to location? So it's not necessarily just like cyber crime, it's actually kind of cyber tracking, it's either someone want to track something digitally, that's something we can do. Right. Um, my suggestion to you, you'd ask about getting yourself out there. Um, the attorneys, um, especially like civil attorneys, there are so many different groups around. My suggestion to you would be um, take a look at the Florida Bar Association, Volusia Bar, Florida Trial Lawyers, all these different groups of attorneys. They have meetings and they also have conventions. And for someone like you with your pedigree, going into a convention for the Florida Young Lawyers Association or the Florida Bar Association setting up a booth, uh, they are looking for people like you. And so going to a place where there's a high concentration of these attorneys, I think as far as marketing bang for the dollar would be the best for you. Because you could go there and you would literally have lawyers passing by your booth and you can show off everything you're doing. And they might be looking for an expert and not knowing where to find it, and there you are right in front of them. So that's my suggestion. No, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I'm also interested in discussing case studies with attorneys so they can hear about cases that have happened uh, that may start turning their wheels of, I, I can ask that, I can approach from that vector, and they may not have known before. So thank you. Hey, let's, uh, let's hear it for Bill. <laughs> I have one last question before you hang up the mic. Uh, what, as a community, can we do for you? Well, what, what you can do today is exactly what, what you've been doing for the last few minutes. Give me that honest, candid feedback. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe we necessarily grow when all we hear is, that's a good idea, right. that sounds great. Um, sure. Uh, but where we grow is that constructive feedback of saying, you know what, this part, I didn't get it, I didn't connect with that, that's great to know. Um, and just continuing that conversation. Uh, my information is there. If you want to raise your hand today to ask a question, I'm, I'm always around, I'm tethered to my email, uh, as a lot of us are, so thank you. All right, round of applause for Bill. Good job, good job, good job, good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Uh, all right, while you're up there, I'm gonna have you help me out a little bit. We, uh, we do a giveaway, so, uh, 